I'm going to go ahead and get started now that it's 4 p.m. Thank you for coming today. My name is Jenny Hunter, and I'm a program manager on the Azure Automation team. Specifically, I own change tracking and inventory, which I'm going to be focusing on today. So just to get a little bit of gauge of room before I start talking, how many people are already familiar with change tracking and inventory? If you could raise your hands. Okay, so not very many, so this is a great opportunity for me to kind of show you what it's all about. So you've probably seen this slide a whole bunch of times before if you've been to any of the product team talks. Essentially, um, much like the talks you heard on Monday, this is all about our recent kind of reorg into Azure. Now we have a seat at the Azure Compute table. This means that we get to leverage things that are specific to the cloud while also working on those scale scenarios for you. So while we focus more in this configure area with configuration, update management, automation, and scripting, we have access to tools throughout the life cycle and a say at the table to integrate with those tools. So automation configuration. Uh, this is kind of our all up platform. This includes process automation, which uh, if you heard Eamon's talk earlier, we have authoring in PowerShell, PowerShell workflow, graphical, and then also a new introduction of Python 2. We also have update management, which if you're interested in learning more about, we have a talk tomorrow morning at 9 by Zach Alexander. And then configuration management, which is the area that I'm going to be focusing on today. It's split into a few different parts, including our version of PowerShell Desired State Configuration, or our expansion on that that we're calling State Configuration. And it's kind of, yeah, that pull server to store your DSC configurations on the cloud. But then also your configuration management through change tracking and inventory. And all of these capabilities are available both on Windows and Linux and in your Azure and non-Azure environments. And it's the same capabilities for both. So you're getting these reports and all of these tools for consistent data and viewing across your environment. So configuration management specifically. Uh, like I said, it's broken into two key components, which is the state configuration side, which is um, our expansion on PowerShell desired state configuration, where we kind of provide a pull server for you and you can put your code in there. And if you saw Michael Green's talk earlier, he delved really deeply into that. But I'm gonna be focusing on the change tracking inventory side. So what changes occurred across your system? What does your system look like? So we're able to track across a few main types, including software, services, files, and registry for Windows, and software, daemons, and files for Linux. So specifically, what do you have and has it changed recently? So really focusing on identifying configuration drift and assisting in root cause analysis of your environment. So did something go wrong? It was probably a change that occurred. So <laughs> yes, again, spanning across both Windows and Linux, Azure, non-Azure. Some key scenarios include creating alerts based on changes that have occurred. Did your IIS service or W3 service suddenly go down? That's an issue, and you want to get alerted on that. As well as identifying all the machines that report a specific configuration, such as all machines that have a specific outdated version of Chrome. And then we also have this native integration with Azure VMs. So Azure VMs are, there's no additional cost to run change tracking inventory on them. And then in addition, you can actually access change tracking inventory from the VM resource menu. So if you go to your Azure VM, you'll notice an operation section and you'll see change tracking and inventory as items underneath that. So I did want to highlight a little more of why are we here at the PowerShell Summit. And that's because change tracking and inventory are built off of PowerShell desired state configuration. For almost all of our main types, we use PowerShell DSC in order to get that reported configuration. We use something called Get Inventory, which is an expanded resource kind of infrastructure that we have. And we use a reference configuration to kind of get that data in. So this API is public for Linux, and I believe it is coming out soon for PowerShell desired state configuration in general and later on versions, but we have this built in right now for change tracking inventory to kind of get the current state of your machine. 
And then we do work on our back end to compare that to previous snapshots we have and to let you know if it's changed. So I'm going to go ahead and go in and just kind of show you what's going on. So here I am in change tracking. You can see, like I said, the main types. We have daemons, files, registry, software, and Windows services. I can easily scope down into a specific section of interest to me by just dragging across, as well as I can limit to a specific type. For instance, if I just want to see what software has changed, I can go and drill down into the different types. I can also do some cool things with features that aren't out yet but are coming out very soon. And uh, I'll talk a little more about how to get access to them later. But for instance, if I want to view file content, I can configure my settings. And I'm sure you saw the lightning demo of this earlier on in the week. But you can actually go in and securely access your file content for specific files that have occurred across your system. And this is done, like I said, securely. And I know this was touched on more earlier, but we actually store it in your own Azure storage account. So Microsoft never has access to your data. And even if something were to occur, people couldn't hack into that data through us. So both private and secured. And then we also have heard from you guys. We have different time windows for collection frequency of the different types. So we're actually bringing down Windows services from a roughly 30 minute collection frequency right now to a minimum of 10 seconds. So really getting that almost real time collections frequency. And so what that would look like on the settings side is right now today you have access to Windows registry, Windows files, Linux files. You'd be able to go into file content, link up a storage account, and then you would see these write SAS URLs. So we never have access to the read SAS URL. And then the collection for Windows services, we could just go ahead and drag that down to, for instance, 26 seconds here, or I could bring it down to 10 seconds. And then inventory is giving you that insight into what is the current state of your environment, or the last reported state. So here I could see that I have 35 machines reporting. If I just want to see my non-Azure machines, I could type in non-Azure and get that list fast. As well as, let's say, I just want to see my Red Hat machines. I could search Red Hat and get the list of all my Red Hat machines and what version of Red Hat they're running. I could also look for specific versions of things, like, for instance, Java. Me being the skilled IT person I am, I know that Java 1.51 is an outdated and potentially a security risk. So I could go in and see exactly which machines have access to this Java. Let me, sometimes the internet connection at the conferences gets a little screwy. So I could see that there are four machines reporting, and I could see exactly which servers have that outdated version of Java, and I could get more specifics by drilling into them. For instance, I could see that Oh, this is interesting. It's actually bouncing back and forth between the versions, and that's probably something I should look into. <laughs> so this kind of gives you the insight. And this is all about, like I said earlier, detecting configuration chain or configuration drift and knowing <coughs> what do you have in your environment, what state is it in, and has it changed recently. So there's also one other thing I wanted to show you guys that I've worked on. I'll take questions at the end. Uh, there's one other thing that I've worked on specifically for the PowerShell Summit, which is we've heard a lot of people say, you know, this is great, but I don't want to constantly be checking the dashboard. And I like to have a clear report that I can show my higher ups and just get this good summary of the data. And so I actually developed a PowerShell script that I'm going to show with you today. This is uh, currently. I'll go to the, so this is currently on the PowerShell gallery, so you have access to this if you want to try it out. Um, so basically, it's a super simple script that takes in the, basically, resource group name, resource group subscription, and then optionally, your Azure Automation account name and your credentials emailed to and from. And 
essentially creates a pretty little email that tells you exactly what has changed in your environment. So here is the final report. Uh, you can see I just triggered this today at 3.49 p.m., so right before I came on. I can see in the past week exactly how many changes occurred in my environment, the top computers with those changes, uh, what type of software is added. I, for instance, I see 17 updates were added and three packages, as well as I saw that there's 22 automatic services that stopped and eight manual services. In addition, um, if you go through, you could see that I have these optional parameters here for automation account information. And what that does is in the email, it provides you with a nice little link that given the automation account information will take you directly to your dashboard in order to see those changes. And so the great thing about this is you can actually run it from a different automation account. For instance, I ran this from an automation account called Team Resources. And then I can actually get my report for an automation account that's completely different, or you could set this up to trigger against multiple automation accounts. So you could send out different emails to different people for different automation accounts. And here I could see I have an automation account called Woodgrove Bank, and I could see the changes that were reported on. So I'm going to go through this script pretty fast, but Essentially, you give in your OMS workspace details, subscription, optionally your automation account, your email details. Um, so the credential name in this case is actually um, your automation account credential. So if you are familiar with automation accounts, you can securely store credentials, connections, and things like this. So this is a credential that's stored in your automation account. But you can always, if you want to run this on premise, there are little changes you can make, for instance, changing how you log in. So most of this script was me trying to figure out how to make it look good in HTML, since let's face it, HTML is not always pleasant to work with. So essentially, get the details, get your um, operational insights, which is your log analytics workspace. And then here I have the exact queries that you run in Log Analytics in order to get these details. So you can customize this script to be any queries you want. So you can make it super customized for your environment, or you can leave it the generic. And this also uses a new module created by the Log Analytics team called Log Analytics Query. And uh, if you go to the PowerShell Gallery page, because it's not currently available in the PowerShell gallery, I have like a, a link to how you can get it. And you can also just go to dev.loganalytics.io in order to find that gallery. And they are working on bringing it soon to the PowerShell gallery. They're just making sure they want to make it securely signed and everything for you. And so this takes those results parses them from JSON, turns them into their tables and rows, and then does all the necessary conversions in order to turn it into uh, the proper HTML format and gets you that report that I showed you before. And so right now this is configured to do past week, but again, this is all customizable. In the script, you'll see exactly where you set the week time frame, and you can adjust that. So if you'd prefer daily emails, monthly emails, you could change that to your need. So like I said, all on the PowerShell gallery. Somehow five people have already downloaded it, so good for them. <laughs> and um, you can run this on, in order to get that weekly frequency, you can actually go into Azure Automation and attach a schedule to it. So it's super easy. If uh, you've seen Eamon's talks or my talks in the past, you've probably seen this process before. But essentially, you just go, you can create a new schedule. So I can just choose a day in the future, say recur every week. Let's do every Tuesday. And I can just change that to 5 p.m. And 
And then here you would just set the parameters that you're interested in. So workspace name, resource group, subscription, credential, email to, email from. You can also set the SMTP server. So the default is Outlook, but if you're using Gmail, Office 365, you can adjust it accordingly. And so that gives you kind of control over the frequency and through Azure Automation, you could schedule it to reoccur kind of without your intervention. So when the job runs, it's gonna give you basically just the, so this is the job that actually produced that email I showed you. And you could see just kind of the HTML that went into it. I could see exactly um, what link was generated for the portal as well as all the information that went into it. So kind of going back a little bit, this kind of gives you that overall, you want to access your information and kind of know what's going on in your environment. And so how do you get back to change tracking inventory at a good frequency? And so it reports those same changes that occurred. So time to talk about kind of where we've come and where we're going. So if you've been following change tracking, um, we have really good consistent frequency of releasing features. Last March, we actually released um, that view you saw where you can click on a change and see what has occurred. Then we released registry and Linux file tracking last April, and inventory was actually introduced in public preview at Ignite this past year, as well as the VM integration. So I can show that quickly. So like I said, if you go to a VM, for instance, I have a Linux VM here, you can scroll down and there's this operations category where there's auto shutdown, backup, disaster recovery, update management, and inventory and change tracking. So I could click on this and it'll show me exactly what is available for that specific machine. So we have that integration exactly on the VM as well as you can bring in your Azure activity log. So if something occurs on Azure, you can see how it correlates to the changes in your environment. And then this past March, we actually GA'd change tracking inventory for both the Azure automation account and in your VM. So what's coming next, I highlighted on some of that today and you've seen it some throughout the different talks throughout the week, but we have that faster window service collection. So bringing down that collection time to almost real time from 30 minutes to about 10 seconds, as well as viewing changes in file content. We're also working on integration with the Azure Security Center. So um, a few of you know probably that a lot of compliance regulations require that you have file integrity monitoring. And so now we have built in integration with Azure Security Center so that we have a little, um, it says file integrity monitoring, or it's going to, it's currently in private preview, but I could show it fast. So when you get to your security center overview, um, when the preview is released, you'll see this in the advanced cloud defense section, the file integrity monitoring. So this offers the same capabilities that we have today through change tracking, except if you're already paying for advanced uh, Azure Security Center, you'll actually get file and registry completely for free and a, or no additional cost for also your on-premise nodes. And you could see across your environment which workspaces are enabled. And then for one that's enabled, you could just click on it. And Azure Security Center actually offers a whole bunch of content and provides you with a list of files and registries that you can track in order to be secure with certain compliance settings. And then finally, a lot of uh, our current customers are currently using change tracking and inventory 
in the OMS portal experience. We will be deprecating that in the near future and focusing on our Azure experience. So you'll still be able to access all your log analytics data from there and still be able to query from there. We just won't be um, maintaining support for the dashboards. And again, if you're interested in any of the private previews I've mentioned, or in general, just joining the cohort and getting to test these features out earlier and before the rest of the world, you can email me at jenny.hunter at microsoft.com, and I'll sign you up. So one of the biggest questions I get from you guys, so what is this going to cost me? So uh, in general, this is the all up pricing for automation and configuration. Update management is free or not, is already included in your VM cost essentially with Azure for Azure and non-Azure nodes. Change tracking, inventory, DSC, and that's the grouping for configuration management. The price is included for Azure nodes and then it's $6 on premise after the first five nodes. And then process automation, so getting to run scripts in your environment is going to be 0.002 dollars per minute and your included is 500 free minutes per month and if you want to get more details kind of about this pricing model and how it affects your environment you could go to aka.ms slash automation pricing okay so I kind of wanted to spend a lot of time focusing on your questions and kind of see if there are specific things that you guys want to see me demo or questions you have so I wanted to allocate that time. So thank you very much. And I'll take questions now. Yes. If our environment had a product, hypothetical, called Toy, Toys R Us app, mm -hmm. and it has an embedded Java to run some of its functions. The trouble is, the, the embedded Java is now a vulnerable version. Mm -hmm. um, the Java will show up when you do the the, the, the command for checking if there's Java on your on your on your box. Would uh, would, would we be uh, having our our inventory system say that we have bad Java or we have a bad Toys R Us app? A red flag on the Toys R Us app. Um. So we don't monitor specific apps through this. Um. So you want to like tag it the changes to a specific item. So we'll tell you which machine is oh, affected. Would be a service. Okay. Yeah. So um, we could show you the version of the software. Um, you can also see, for instance, uh, in update management, if you do have a Java that's out of compliance. Oh, this is machines list. If we had the uh, the information on the Toys R Us app, could that be added to it? To, a, to an inventory query. Um, can you rephrase the question just a little bit? If, if we have the identifying information on the Toys mm -hmm. R Us app, could we if you, go to Microsoft Azure and say, we, we'd like to watch this? Yeah, so if you have the information about which machines are running, so uh, just to make sure everybody can hear, he's asking if we have the identifying information of an app that's running and we want to make sure that Java is always up to date or is compliant, do we have access to that information? Can we run a query for it? So if you, probably you could do a mix of, if you want to make sure it's always up to date, you could check to see if there's a non-compliance for that machines with update management data. You could also check if you just want to make sure that there's a specific version that you don't want to have on your environment. You can get the inventory data for the machines that you know are involved. The image and for, uh, or the, or the, a challenge for, uh, for updating is Java won't show up in the programs and features because it's not a standalone version of Java. The, okay. the, the company that made the Toys R Us app, it just, they embedded the Java code in the product. Okay, so if there is a EXC for the Java, then you know where that EXC is going to be. I can show you through the settings. You can actually go to your settings here. And so we watch all um, Windows and Linux software, Windows services, and Linux daemons by default. So if it's running a service, we'll catch it by default. If you're looking for specific registries or files, 
you can specify here exactly which registries you want. And same with files. You can, so if you're looking to track a specific exe that isn't being found by the software portion, you can go and find, go to the folder that has the exe and put the file path here in order to track it. And then same on Linux, and we're working on this parity for Windows and hopefully coming out in the near future, but Linux is actually more advanced on our side. We spend a lot of time focusing on the Linux development. And so you can actually do uh, regex right now for Linux where you could do the wildcard support and recursion support. And did I have another question over here? I was just gonna ask if you can upload, like so if you have like a specific internal like CVE equivalent, can you tag that so that it'll um, pull that data up over time? So like, let's say I, I discover that, you know, we have some sort of um, bug in the code, we're not really sure where we deployed it, if we managed to catch everything. We can specify something in the, in the portal here to like go recursively check, which I think is what you're showing here. Like, mm -hmm. If it's not already tracking it, I can force it to track. Yep. yep. Okay. Your uh, file content is tracking files on, on Windows that you're mm -hmm. Okay, so we actually focused a lot on the security and privacy side when developing the Windows uh, or the file content feature. So the question was whether how we take into consideration with GDPR and all that. Um, so we're not actively storing any of your personal information. So you generate the write SAS key, so that gives us access to only write into the storage account that you provided. And so we'll write the file content into a blob in that storage account. And then when you go to access the file content, your browser and your, through the authentication of your login in Azure generates the read token. So if someone doesn't have RBAC access to that storage account, that tech will fail and they won't be able to access the file content. We're leveraging Azure Automation DSC and paying the six dollars uh, per node per month. Is this inventory system included in that cost? Yes. Yeah, so if you're already paying the six dollars for Azure Automation DSC, this is also included in that configuration management cost. So if you're already paying it, you basically get this for free. So you get both change checking and inventory in addition to what you're already paying for with DSC. Can you also just give a quick high level about how the on-prem is communicating up to this uh, for its inventory purposes? Okay, so um, uh, so the question is to give a quick overview of how inventory and change tracking are communicating for on-premise nodes. And so we use something called uh, the MMA, or Microsoft Monitoring Agent. You might be familiar with uh, SCOM uses this agent, or uh, other OMS services also use this agent. And so through that, we push down uh, MP to the system that uh, has those different DSC resource blocks I was telling you about with for uh, the uh, daemon services and has that get inventory call. So if I go back to my slides. So um, we push down the, the MP that has the code we need for that get inventory call, that extended resource infrastructure and the DSC reference configuration reports back to us through the OMS agent, or the MMA. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, questions about, in general, how do you, uh, what kind of machines you're grabbing from our on-premises and how that happens? And secondly, what level of granularity do you have on changes? Uh, permission changes, for example, or, okay. or just content? So, let me go to show you. So um, when you ask about on-premise machines, are you asking about like what type of operating systems do we no, grab? I just consume the data. I've got a private data center over here. Okay. We'll consume it in. So yeah, so we use the Microsoft monitoring agent to actually uh, gather that data. And so it does use an internet connection, but they have something called OMS Gateway, which allows you to proxy to servers that you don't or can't give internet access to. And as far as uh, what kind of changes we pick up, so I could drill down into one of these changes. And so we do a few different things. Our file tracking uses the MD5 hashing algorithm. So we're able to tell for content changes as well as we're tracking the file content. So I can click here and actually see 
what changed in this file, and both inline if you prefer that way or side by side. And then um, we also track ACL changes, and for most things like registry, we check even if it's just been touched. So even if no changes have occurred or it's more of an access control change, we do track that also. So the DSC resource backend gives us a lot of control of making sure that we're catching any change that can occur. Uh, for files, we're looking at not just the contents, but um, date modified, date created, and like I said, we have the ACLs here. So we can check if there's any change to that. Are you using DSS to be able to give me the delta between the two? Or, or how, how are you able to track the content changes? So for the content, so the question is how are we tracking the content changes? Um, we check if there is a content change by comparing the hashing algorithms, or the hashes that come out from the MD5. And then um, once we determine that there is a change, then we upload the content. So how, um, did you, how do you get the delta, though, between what was there before? So we have um, kind of like a pipeline on our back end that just does a quick comparison between uh, the results of the MOFs that we've sent. Does that? I'm not sure I'm following you on um, VSS. Well, uh, OK. So. So you're monitoring my entire file system for changes? So we only monitor the files that you've specified. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so then those files get uploaded to my storage account, and that's how you're able to do the comparison? Uh, for the file content, yes. we first do the comparison on the machine for the hash, and we upload only upload the file content um, if we've determined that there is already a change. So you can specify exactly which files you want to track. And then we do a first comparison on the machine itself. And then only once we verify that there has been a change in the content, do we send up the file content to your storage block. Okay. Do you upload a copy of the file as soon as I say, like, track this thing? Like, that goes, like, they get, you get the hash? And because there was no file, now there is a file that goes Yep, so um, yeah. as soon as you indicate that you want to track an item, that next iteration, uh, so for instance, Windows files is about every 30 minutes, and then on Linux, I believe it's every five to 10 minutes. Um, so that next check that we do on the machine will gather the file content. Yeah. So the files that you're sending over to my storage account, what handles the cleaning or what's, what's keeping that data from being consumed throughout? So I would have to follow up a little bit, probably more with you offline, on the exact specifics. But um, I believe we have an expiration on, so the question was, how do I keep the data from just continuing to grow, and how do we prune it to make sure that it doesn't go old while still maintaining that you can see a file change that occurred 30 days ago, wherever, however long your cycle is for maintaining uh, data in log analytics. And so, um, I don't have the exact specifics, but uh, especially because we're in private preview, we're taking a lot of feedback on how people want us to do this. Our current default, I believe, is um, about every 30 days we just expire. Do you support, I'm sorry, I was just going to ask, do you support wildcards in there? So, um, yeah, I was mentioning this very briefly earlier, but um, we're working on that support for Windows, and hopefully that will be coming out in the next several months. Um, our Linux file support does support wildcards and recursion. And then I had a question over uh, here. Possible extension to schedule task at some time? So the, to schedule a task? No, to, to monitor schedule task. Oh, to monitor schedule and task. Um, what would that be stored as? I'm sorry? What would the scheduled task be? Are you looking at like cron jobs or? Um, really any, anything, the, the command lines, the parameters, Okay. I guess you can export to XML or something, but you know. Mm -hmm. OK, so we don't currently have support for um, monitoring like XML or um, command line prompts, but we do love feedback. So you could either, if you have any additional feedback, feel free to um, stop by after the session or to go to our feedback page, which if you try us out, um, we have a little link at the top that says provide feedback, and it goes directly to our user voice where you could create an item and get votes on it to try and 
um, get the services that you want. Okay, one last question. Okay, so there's a, uh, a way to do it through DSC in order to check if a scheduled task has changed. Okay, great. So I'll take remaining questions uh, after this, but thank you everyone for joining us and thank you for attending and joining the PowerShell Summit.